Good morning, guys. I'm in my room, so you know what that means. We're doing a get ready with me, and we're talking about some PhD stuff. I had a question on one of my videos, and it was, can you walk me through what Canadian grad schools are like? Specifically, what are the stipends like? Does it suffice the cost to live? So let's talk about some money, and let's talk about what it costs to live in Vancouver. So stipend is dependent on two things. Your stipend is dependent on the amount your school says is the minimum stipend. In Canada, this can be anywhere from 27,000 to 30,000. Some schools even require a minimum much higher than this. And you can get paid this salary in two ways. So number one, you could have your professor buy you out. So they pay you per year to just work in the lab. Number two, if your professor does not have, for example, the funds to pay you this entire amount, then you have to TA and you'd be a full-time TA. Another way to get your stipend money, but you'd have to be a Canadian citizen for this, there are some international scholarships, but I can only speak on behalf of the Canadian Graduate Awards, but you can apply to the Canadian Graduate Scholarship Awards. So the CGSM is the master's one for the NSERC. I gotta look up what NSERC stands for. NSERC stands for the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, a federal agency that funds scientific research discovery and innovation in natural sciences and engineering to benefit Canada. So if you receive this award for your PhD, I did gratefully receive one, you get $40,000 per year tax-free money for three years. So then you would supply your own funding. At certain schools, there's also internal donor awards. So I go to the Simon Fraser University and they have so many internal donor awards. I think they even have full ride international student scholarships. So if you are an international student, you could apply to the internal donor awards and you could, if you win, supply your own stipend through winning an award that comes from a donor at SFU. So what have we covered so far? Money. In Canada, you're making around thirty to forty thousand dollars, let's say at a minimum. Does this allow you to live reasonably in Vancouver? I'll break down my expenses. I pay about one thousand one hundred dollars per month in rent. I'll even pull up my calculator for you guys. So one thousand one hundred times twelve. So that's thirteen thousand two hundred dollars per year. So if we base this off of 30,000, so that'd be what a regular PhD student makes, you have $16,800 left after rent, and that is if you have a roommate. So if you'd want to live alone, things get really expensive really fast. I have a roommate. I met my roommate at school. So what you could do is you could find a roommate on Facebook Marketplace, which is what I did in my first year. And then after I got to know my classmates, I then decided to room with one of my classmates in the following year. And we've been living together ever since. And even in my first rental, it was even cheaper, but it wasn't in as nice of a place. Uh, I paid $800, $850 a month in rent. So if you have a roommate, rent in Vancouver is reasonable. But if you don't, I have heard the one bedrooms, one bathrooms will go for around $2,100. So you're paying double if you do not have a roommate, which I guess makes sense. <laughs> Having a roommate would split the cost, but you're still paying that amount for a single room. Groceries can be really cheap depending on where you shop and what you eat. So there's these markets on 49th Avenue that I found out for my first rental, but you can get veggies, like a literally a whole bag of veggies for $20, like a whole bag filled of veggies. If you go to these little markets, the street markets, the food is extremely cheap. There's also a grocery store called TNT Market. It's some sort of Asian fusion grocery store and the food there is so cheap. And you can also buy pre-packed lunches there for a really reasonable price prices. I would say that I spend maybe 300 to 500 if I decide to eat out per month on food. But usually, usually it's on the lower end around $300 when I'm being good with my money. 
So we can do a calculation for that. So 300, let's say 350 times 12. So that's $4,200. So we're at $12,600 left. What else do you need? Well, you need transit. If you go to SFU, will you get a free student bus card? So transit is paid for within your tuition and your tuition in the PhD program is stipend. Now, if you had a car and you wanted to drive, then this would obviously add a little bit of expenses in addition to food and rent. But if you don't drive and you're only paying for food and you're only paying for rent, then I would say yes, Vancouver is reasonable to live if you have a roommate. The roommate thing is really important. I think if you don't have a roommate, it would be tough. To make ends meet. There's two exchange students in my lab. They're both postdocs though. The one postdoc has a roommate which she met on Facebook marketplace and the other one lives alone and the one that lives alone pays around $21 to $2,200 a month for a one bedroom one bathroom basement suite. My other friend who's from Spain is paying around what I pay for a two bedroom one bathroom basement suite once again. I'm not too sure what the high-rise condo units are paying, but this would be for a two-bedroom, one-bathroom basement suite. Now, if you decide to do some extracurricular fun, like for example, go to the bars, go out for dinner, that stuff in Vancouver is extremely expensive. Like, I swear to God, you can't have a night out in Vancouver without dropping $100 to $200. Like, it is so ridiculously expensive. That's why I barely go. Just kidding, I barely go because I hate having fun. <laughs> but if you wanna go and eat lunch at a restaurant, well, yeah, you're also looking at 25 to $30 for lunch. And dinner, same thing, 25 to $40 if you're eating out for lunch. The next question the same person asked me had to do with if I have any advice for how to prep for an interview with your PI. So they might ask you basic questions if you're doing inorganic chemistry, they might ask you how to make a metal complex. If you're doing organic chemistry, they might ask you how to set up a reaction. They might ask you a very simple reaction. What are the reagents for the green yard reaction? They might ask you some sort of simple application based question, but this should be something that if you've done research in the field, you would know how to answer. And then they're just gonna ask you about your previous research experience. So as long as you can talk about the projects that you've worked on in a manner that reflects your understanding of the projects, you will be completely fine. They just want to see that you have learned how to learn because a PhD is really just an amplified version of learning how to learn. In undergraduate, you should be able to learn how to learn, consume knowledge, and then in your master's and your PhD, you need to flip it around so you need to start learning how to consume knowledge, but also produce new knowledge. I think most professors in Canada that I've at least worked with and or heard of are reasonable people. People don't work the craziest of hours here, depending on what lab group you're in. Organic chemists usually work the most, I would say. But for me in a radiochemistry group, people work like a nine to five. I would say there's been some times during my master's and last year my PhD where I will work a lot. So I'll work like a 15, 16 hour shift, but then I won't work for a few days. So it really depends. But usually the hours are kept between 30 to 40 hours per week. But if you do have to TA full time, then this can end up being a lot. Another thing you might get asked is, well, why do you want to come to Canada? And we had a student that we were interview <laughs> answer this question really badly. So I'm gonna tell you about that answer so you don't say something like this. They said, I want to come to Canada for the mountains. If I'm being honest, I'm not too interested in the chemistry. And you know what? Completely fair. We have beautiful mountains here in British Columbia, but don't say that in your interview. Say, well, after reading the publications on your guys's group website, I was really interested in the work that you are doing. And I feel that my previous experience doing this, explain whatever you've done in the past, would allow me to not only expand my current skill set, but implement the things that I have learned learned in a different situation and I'm excited to learn new things. I would say something like that. So relate what the group is doing that you're applying to to your previous research, how your previous research is going to benefit you in this new situation and something you could potentially learn in this new research group. That's how I would answer that question. Even if I am coming to Vancouver just to see the mountains, like don't don't say that. 
Don't say that. All right, I am ready for school. I'm not really doing anything at school today. I just need to bring a gift to my PI. I always get her a Christmas gift and then I'm gonna get coffee with a friend and then lunch with another colleague and then probably come home and call her a day. Um, but love you guys so much. Hopefully this video was helpful. If you made it this far, please make sure to leave a like, comment, save, and or subscribe to my channel and let me know if you have any more questions that you want me to answer in the comment box down below.